May we ever look through the grace-washed eyes of affection by which our God would have us see one another. Amen. Easter Day, 1997. George Council, in his Easter sermon, tells the congregation, and I quote, 20 years ago, my father-in-law, a Lutheran pastor, stood up at the funeral of his wife and told the church, the promises of God are sure. And then he sat down. What better moment to preach his shortest and perhaps his greatest Easter sermon, end quote. <laughs> Pastor Tejan told the gospel truth, the promises of God are sure. Unfortunately, perhaps for you, neither the Bishop of Massachusetts nor the presiding bishop are as pithy as Pastor Tejan. <laughs> but then, Neither was George. <laughs> Let me speak of the top five loves of George Council. Number five, George Council loved to read. He read voraciously. He would quote to you from Dante or Philip Yancey or John Donne or Maya Angelou. The thing was, it didn't have to be high-flown or literary. I once heard him construct an entire sermon around the Velveteen Rabbit, <laughs> about how we are made real by being loved. You know the story. You'll recall that the evidence of the Velveteen Rabbit having been loved and therefore being real was that its fur had been rubbed off. The sermon was for the installation of a new rector. George took special delight in pointing out that like the rabbit, the parish's new priest was rather bald and therefore <laughs> obviously lovable and real. The man's reading tastes were prodigious and always there was a gospel message in there somewhere. Number four, George Council loved baseball. <laughs> Wherever he went, he took to the ballpark. In Western Mass, as canon to the ordinary, he would lead the clergy in a pickup ball game each year during clergy conference. I once heard George construct an entire theology of mission around Bob Euchre, the legendary broadcast announcer <laughs> for the Milwaukee Brewers. Whenever a Milwaukee slugger hit a potential homer, Euchre, you may know, would coax the ball out of the park, shouting, get up, get up, get out of here. George loved that. And he reckoned it was a decent summary of what churchgoers were supposed to do. Not sit around in their pews, but get up and get out of here. Occasionally, in spite of George's tendency towards rather strict prayer book rubrical adherence, occasionally he would instruct the deacon to use Euchre's shout as the liturgy's dismissal. <laughs> get up, get up, get out of here. The man's appetite for baseball was prodigious, and always there was a gospel message in there somewhere. Number three, George Council loved music. Concert going, drumming in the basement, playing air guitar in a hospital bed. His joy when singing was irrepressible. 
Sometime after leaving Chicago for Cleveland, I noticed that the acolytes in my new church were making fun of me for bouncing up onto my toes when singing a particularly joyous hymn. And I realized that I had picked that up from George, <laughs> from singing next to him for all those years. He was musically omnivorous, conversant on a range of musicians from Verdi to the hip-hop artist Mose Def and everything in between. I once heard him construct an entire Easter sermon around Chumbawamba, <laughs> the 90s British rock band, and their hit sensation, Tub Thumping. <laughs> Do you remember its catchy chorus? I get knocked down, but I get up again. You are never going to keep me down. I get knocked down, but I get up again. You are never going to keep me down. I mean, sure, there's an Easter message in there, but this, <laughs> this is not one of the songs your grandmother sang you. <laughs> I mean, who thinks to preach a sermon on Chumbawamba on Easter Day in well-heeled Lake Forest, Illinois? <laughs> George, that's who. The man's appetite for music was prodigious. And always, there was a gospel message in there somewhere. Number two, George Council loved the church. He loved the church. He loved its every manifestation. He loved the vestments and the sacraments and the sacred spaces. And he loved them because he knew them to be vessels of God's grace. And he loved the people that he served in LA, in Western Massachusetts, in Chicago. And when the Diocese of New Jersey was in need of healing, when it appealed in its profile for Quote, a person of prayer who lives the faith, one who is a peacemaker and a spiritual diplomat. Well, George answered the call, and you got the bishop that you sought. He loved to make his declaration in Spanish. Me encanta la iglesia. I love the church. The church enchants me. As he once wrote, I haven't got all the answers, and I am not a good Christian, but by grace I have decided to follow Jesus and to join in kingdom building with other disciples in the fellowship of Christ's church. The man's love for Jesus and for the church and for her people was prodigious. And always there were people to love. Loved to read, loved baseball, loved music, loved the church. And supremely beyond all else, George loved Ruth and the families from which George and Ruth came, and the family they created. Through the years, we all heard about Sarah's studies in China and later her organizing work. Never was George more eager to travel than when he was making the father-daughter drive to Oberlin. The girl's accomplishments, and more importantly, the manifestly good people they became. Nothing made George more proud or happy. And as the girl's own families grew, the circle of his love just grew with them. 
George and Ruth, you know, were college sweethearts. And there was something about that youthful sweetness and delight that continued to characterize their love for each other for 47 years. George rejoiced at Ruth's artistic gift and the ways she found to share it. But the greatest gift for George was Ruthie herself. And so he loved her. And so she returned his love with quiet abundance. With quiet abundance. That she forgave the church for its demands upon her beloved is one more gift to be acknowledged. Nobody but Ruth knows the complete cost of George's struggle with Parkinson's for the past decade, and especially the past three years. Both of them faced into it with characteristic grace and strength. To the diagnosis, George responded by heading off to climb Kilimanjaro with his favorite deacon. You might say George responded to his disease with his chumbawamba theology. <laughs> I get knocked down, but I get up again. You are never going to keep me down. Ruth says that the physical manifestations which others noticed were really not the hardest part. The hardest part, of course, was the cognitive diminishment. Yet even that was met with characteristic sweetness and humor. At one point, Ruth relates, she sent him to the grocery store for eggplant. He returned home with chocolate cake. <laughs> Ruth, I wonder if you are quite sure that that was a cognitive lapse. <laughs> Not long ago, he came back from the grocery inexplicably, says Ruth, with eight packages of Hebrew national hot dogs. <laughs> when Ruth gently wondered what he was thinking, he replied, oh, well, it, it's for all my friends. There aren't enough hot dogs for all of George's friends. So Ruth pointed out that he forgot the buns. <laughs> and the next day, George made another trip to the store and returned with a few dozen hamburger buns. <laughs> and a few days ago, his family had a picnic to enjoy George's hot dogs, a Eucharistic feast, if ever there was one. It is said that in old age or illness, many of us become more of whatever we are. So George became more gentle, more kind, more humble, more sweet, more patient, more faithful. In 2003, here is what this diocese said in its profile that it hoped for. The brave heart that is not discouraged, the hopeful heart that makes the best of all things, this is the heart needed in our next bishop. Well, you got it, my friends. George rarely spoke of his family in sermons. Wise man, that George. <laughs> but here is one final story from 1997 with which to conclude. George wrote, Some years ago, one of our daughters took a serious interest in music and set out to become a professional. 
As I sat with her one day before an important audition, I handed her a card that read, let them know you love it. George continues, our goal is so to live that the world may know that we love life for the love of God who gave us this wondrous gift, the grace to enjoy it, and a passion to share it for the sake of Jesus Christ. So thank God for George, for the wondrous gift of his life, for the grace with which he enjoyed it, and for the love and passion with which he shared it. Christ is risen. George is risen with him. Alleluia.